we're going to talk about tree care, and that comes on the heels of, let's see, tree problems, uh, tree selection, tree planting, and now tree care. So Sarah and I put our heads together and we kind of decided that, well, we ought to think about, especially on the heels of what Kelly presented last week on planting new trees, um, we thought maybe we'd split it into caring for new and young trees. And I guess we'll define new trees as 2020 and young trees as the last decade or so. And then we kind of broke it into these, these four areas. Sarah. Oh, yes. And then we will be talking about um, um, the care of mature trees will be the second half of the presentation. So uh, we're going to start off here with our young trees. Start off with the young trees and you can see some of the most common ones that people make mistakes with. But then a lot of this is couched in problem prevention. And it's really hard to, um, to think about it the other way around. You know, problem prevention is such that problems are much easier to prevent than they are to fix. Yes. Um, and here you can just see prevention through inspection. Uh, that's one of the important steps, taking a good close look on a regular basis. Uh, Kelly pointed out a few structural issues. We'll continue on with that. Um, certainly soil moisture is a big deal. Uh, across much of the state, we didn't have much moisture. Uh, we were into some of the drought categories on some of the state. So, and then hopefully we'll get caught up just a tad. Mulching is one of the techniques we do use to uh, hold in moisture. Physical injury, it's amazing how much physical injury we see out there. Uh, we're gonna introduce the topic of separating trees and turf. Now I have some photos to show what we mean by that. Um, we'll introduce a couple of common pests and Jody will certainly be there to support that. And then uh, pruning is a problem prevention technique as well. So we'll start off by uh, some of the initial uh, defects. Now. Whenever I'm with me, I have an occupational hazard of bringing my photo, or bringing my camera, excuse me. And then of course now it's an iPhone, but um, there are some really good and bad things in this photo. Uh, I'm gonna start off by showing some of the good things, and I think um, there's a couple of bad things. In the left center, along the left side, the left side there, you can see some branch angles that are really good you've got about a 45 degree branch angle. If you hold up your hand in front of your face and you make it, kind of look at your palm, um, that's the angle you want. And you see where your thumb attaches to the rest of your hand, that's sort of an L shape. That's the kind of angle you want. And the uh, branches all along the left side there are arranged that way. But unfortunately, Sarah, not so much on the right side. Yeah, in fact, John, why don't you take your cursor and on that uh, trunk on the left side, show them what you're talking about with this, um, a this wider branch angle, which is uh, actually a much stronger junction than a narrow branch angle. Yeah, right in this area here is really good. And then even right below, I didn't even see that right here too as well. And then another one right down here. Right. So these branch angles are kind of in the 45 degree, uh, maybe 50 degree attachment to the main stem, the main trunk. And they will develop an increase in size and they will not compete with each other as opposed to what we see here in the middle. Right. Very so quickly, that's going to start pushing on each other and that, that will be a big problem. So what you're so saying That just needs that, to be taken care of early. In that, ahead, center, that center trunk where the, the branch angles are very narrow, um, you don't have strong attachment between those, those branches where they come together there. So it's, it's much easier for a branch to fail when we have um, a narrow branch angle like this, especially if the two sides of the two competing branches are similar in size. Then they become what we call co-dominant branches or co-dominant trunks. And the, the, um, uh, those two factors together, the branches that are the same size and that very narrow branch angle creates a weak joint. And we quite often see trees fail at that joint particularly like we're gonna, well, hopefully they won't get it out in Western Nebraska. If we have early season snow or ice when there's still leaves on the trees, that, that's a heavy weight and it's, it's, um, it's a quite easy situation for us to see significant damage at these types of junctions in a tree. 
here a little bit more close up version of the same kind of thing. Um, we're just about six inches away from the tree trunk at this point. And again, um, I will show just a couple of features that make it easy to, sh to see what's going on here. It's this, this attachment right here is what we're talking about, kind of that V between your two, two first fingers. Um, right in here is a branch structure called the branch bark ridge where my uh, cursor is. That's just a good landmark to pay attention to. And then right over here where the cursor is, is something called the branch collar. And a little bit later on, we'll be pointing that out, uh, that that's a good place to make a pruning cut. And in fact, that would be our recommendation here. Now you could make a pruning cut here, like, oops, sorry. You could make a pruning cut right here and that would work. Or you could make a pruning cut here and that would work a lot better. If we make the first cut, that's gonna create a pretty large wound. And while that would help to remove the, the problem branch, um, this wound is gonna be about half the size and the wound is gonna close a lot faster as a result of the proper placement of the, of the saw. So just outside the branch bark ridge and just outside the collar and that'll make a nice cut there and the wound will close over pretty quickly. Uh, again, problem prevention. Uh, we've got a lot of problems in this, in this photo. Sarah, you can probably mention some of them, but the first and most obvious one is this crack. And again, this is a, a development of a, a double leader or a co-dominant leader through a little bit of windstorm. This isn't that big a tree. This is definitely in that younger category. Um, just a little bit of storm damage on this has made a big crack in this tree, along with all the stuff on the left as well. And this is what eventually happens with those, those narrow branch angles and those co-dominant leaders is quite typically trees will develop a crack at that joint. And once that trunk starts to crack, um, it'll just get worse and worse over time. Um, you'll get water in that crack in the winter that will freeze and expand and push the two high sides farther apart. Um, so there's really no repairing this. Um, but it, it, so what we're trying to get at here is you really need to address these types of, of branch, structural branch issues when the tree is young. And you can, um, you can make small pruning cuts on the tree that will eliminate these very easily. Now here's another situation that's similar, but different yet. You see these in all varieties, shapes, and forms. If you were really good with a pruning saw, you might be able to eliminate the middle stem here and you'd eliminate the included bark that you see where this branch here pushes on this branch here, and you'd eliminate the, the crack as well. Ideally, you would have done that two years previous to this, um, when these were maybe about an inch in size. Now they're about two, two and a half inches in size, and you can see this will only get worse. So these are just more examples of the same kind of thing. Now here's... Once you start to look for these, these structural defects in trees, you're gonna find that they're really very common. And um, unfortunately, sometimes the way that homeowners prune when they don't understand good pruning techniques um, exacerbates these problems and, and really um, uh, creates them. It, it creates them instead of getting rid of them, so. Good point, and, and here's a, a problem that should again, should have been taken care of two years previous and, and not only did you have a bad branch angle here, but now we have this rubbing, which is an ongoing wound, sort of a constant wounding of the tree. So this should have been taken care of a while previous. And um, again, just one more different iteration of the same problem um, where the, this wounding has caused a lot of problems. So those are some initial st uh, uh, structural defects that need to be taken care of. We'll shift over to soil moisture, which is a sort of a prevention issue. Now, John, if you look at the photo in this, you're probably pretty familiar with this type of material being used for soaker hoses that you see in a vegetable garden. And the vegetable gardeners who are watching tonight uh, would see this similar. Now, the same type of device is available for trees as well. And if you haven't seen it, it's really just sort of a recycled truck tire or car tire material that's been formed and extruded into a tube and it can be made in one straight line for row crops like carrots, or in this case, be kind of extruded into a circle for new trees. 
And it really works well just to ooze out and kind of just slowly over, over a period of, I don't know, five, six hours, wet this, uh, this area. And then you got the mulch in place to keep it there too. So a device like this can be very handy. Or you can use a device like this. Now this is something that probably everybody has. Um, and you can see by the turf and how poorly it's performing, how, just how badly that, uh, that soil moisture is needed. Um, regardless of the device you use, you have to realize that soil moisture is supplementary. And we just went through about eight weeks of Mother Nature saying, no, no, I'm in control of what's going on here, not you. And so we've had to do a lot of supplementary in terms of moisture. Um, when you're looking at them, this is a good diagnostic tip right here. And uh, later this week, a bunch of us are going to get together and, and try to do some of this uh, investigation ourselves. Um, a little bit of uh, a little bit of self training, if you will. Um, but essentially, what this is is a long screwdriver shaft that I've stuck in the ground and then pulled out. And what we're really looking for is just what does the soil look like when you pull it out. We're searching for moist, not soggy, and not dry. And of course, we all have we have different soil types and different trees. Some prefer slightly drier conditions than others, but in general, this is kind of our our go-to target is to have moist but not soggy and not, not dry soils. Mm -hmm. An important thing to remember too is that 90% of a tree's water absorbing roots are in the top 18 to 24 inches of the mm -hmm. soil. So when we water, we want to water from the top of the soil and, and try to get that water to go down deep. And so in the previous picture with the um, sprinkler or the in-ground irrigation system, um, you would have to run that much longer to effectively water for a tree than you would for a turf. Um, typically when I'm watering my trees at home, I use a, a cheap little plastic round sprinkler that I got at Ace Hardware, I think. And I'll, I'll put it on one side of the tree, trying to wet the area from the trunk to the edge of the widest branch. And I'll focus on that area and let the sprinkler run for about an hour. Then you could take this, the screwdriver, as John just showed you, and push it down into the soil. And when you start to hit resistance in the soil, you have reached the drier layers. And then that'll give you an indication of how far down you have actually watered uh, with that, that um, irrigation head and that amount of timing. And then I would move my irrigation head all the way around the tree, watering every, every area until I've watered the whole circumference of the tree. And Sarah, that's exactly what this device is. Uh, it's an inexpensive, lightweight, easy to use device that can be hooked up and just used for a um, period of time. And I'm going to cover with this, you know, about a third of the tree's rooting area. So it will need to be moved uh, later. Let it run for an hour, test the soaker hose, uh, test to see how far it's soaked in, and then move it accordingly. One of the so things John, that helps us keep the moisture in the ground is mulch. Were you going to say something? I'm sorry. Yeah, John, Georgia has a question about what do I look for on the screwdriver to, um, to tell if I'm watering correctly. So I think one of the things, Georgia, you would look at is just how far down into the soil can you push the screwdriver? That would be one thing. And what else would you suggest, John? Well, the, that's a good first one. It's just how much resistance there is uh, and how easy is it to push, push it in the ground. And then secondly, um, if, if soil does attach to this, the shaft or the screwdriver blade, what does it look like? Is it dry and powdery? Is it, does water drip off the screwdriver blade? <laughs> I've seen that before. Or is it like this, where it's just kind of a nice, moist, uh, it's not muddy, but it's just kind of a nice, moist consistency. So ideally, this is what you want to look for, but both are good where you're looking for just how hard it is to push it in the ground and how far can you push it in easily. And then what does it look like when it comes out? Invariably, there'll be some kind of uh, uh, a little bit of, of soil that comes out with it. So good question, Georgia. Um, it's good to hold the moisture in. Once the moisture is there on a new planting like this, it's good just to hold it in the ground. Um, now, you can see that the, the, um, the soil uh, is there, the, the mulch layer is there, about two inches thick, and it's, it's, it's been pulled back just a little bit from the tree trunk. Now, we would prefer it be pulled back a little bit more. It looks like it's been pulled back just a few inches. Probably best to pull it back about six inches or so, because we really don't like 
uh, damage from um, any kind of critter. And they like to, to, to uh, find a place to do that. And also it, it holds a little bit more moisture around the trunk than we would like. But ideally, this is a good setup where we have a, a nice big wide uh, mulch area. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the metal ring uh, that, that is used here, but it's kind of a personal preference. That tends to be something that gets in the mid middle of my uh, lawnmower blade. Um, and in eastern Nebraska, where the soil heaves, it tends to be pushed up over time. But initially, it doesn't look too bad. Now, this is what you want to avoid. And I think Kelly showed a, a couple of these photos last week is where you're actually mounding up mulch is probably 12 inches thick here into sort of what is viewed as a volcano. And uh, the problem with it is when it's wet, it actually holds a lot of water right on the bark. And when it's dry, it actually sheds water away from the bark like a thatch roof would do. Um, and so neither one of those extremes are, are any good. You can see the same kind of thing. And I was, I was just shocked. This was a new planting in an area that's about a mile from my house. Um, and I, I, think, I, I seriously had this thought that the contractor here must get paid by the yard of mulch that they apply here because more is better in that mind, or at least more is better for their invoice. But a real problem here, um, the only thing good about this is that it does keep the weed whip away or a 15 year old ne'er-do-well who maintain this is that it does keep them because they, as they're hitting the lawnmower up against it, they bounce off the, the uh, mulch bed here first before they actually hit the trunk. But uh, problems written all over this. Yeah, this, this really makes me angry when I see this, John, because it's so, so common in commercial plantings. You know, if you go to and look at any commercial landscape as you drive around, you know, 95% of the time you're going to see the trees mulch this way. And it's to the point where, you know, your average gardener who sees this thinks, oh, this must be the way to do it. I must need to pile the mulch up around the trunk like this. And this is really a bad idea. There's a, there's a lot of problems with this. Um, so this is this is 100% the wrong way to mulch. Yeah, this was more of a residential uh, application or maybe a park-like application. And this is a, a commercial area it's near where I get my hair cut. Um, but yeah, it's sort of used as, a, as an example because if a professional does it, it must be the way to do it. So we need more uh, illustrations on, on what not to do. Now, as the tree diameter grows, this is the same tree we were watering before. It's just four, three, four years later. You're gonna want to expand the mulch ring um, uh, and you're gonna want to expand it out. Again, it's one of those things where you can see where the initial ring was just from the color and the sun bleaching. And then I'm basically here doubling the size of the mulch ring uh, and, and to the point where it is now sort of underneath the branches. And as it comes out, you want to expand that a little bit more because the branches uh, grow out, so do the roots. And you really, the, the uh, mulch is there to keep the roots cool and hold in moisture. Um, it's not a trunk treatment, it's a root treatment <laughs> so that the uh, roots can stay cool and moist and, and hopefully suppress some of the growth. We often get the question, Sarah, about um, do I need to kill the grass before we do this? And um, routinely, I, I tell people, no, just put the mulch right on top. Right. You can easily smother the turf with the, with the mulch. Um, and then that negates the need for you to put down Roundup or to, um, or to um, strip the turf off by hand or with a sod cutter. Um, so that's typically what I do if I'm enlarging a sod bed is, is, or enlarging a mulch bed is I might cut the edge of the bed where I want it to be just using a natural, a natural edge cut with a spade. And then I'll just smother out any grass that is remaining um, in the mulched area. So John, Priscilla was asking, she wanted us to confirm um, uh, how, how far to pull the mulch back away from the trunk. And you had said, you know, ideally about six inches. Um, and then the, the depth of the mulch should be anywhere from two to four inches, depending on what type of mulch you're using. You know, if it's a, a more porous type of a mulch, you're, you might go a little bit deeper. Um, and if it's a, a type of mulch that may compact or develop a fairly, um, a, a fairly thick layer, then you might just go a little bit shallower. But the, the general recommendation is somewhere between two to four inches of mulch. Right. And that's what we've strived for here. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't do the mulching, this is what can happen. 
And again, this is uh, injury from a string trimmer or from the lawnmower itself. It's funny because if you look back to some old videos that you might have, um, when string trimmers were introduced in the 70s, the actual usage on a commercial was showing trimming around a tree. Um, and then it took a little while to get the word out to the manufacturers that no, no, that's not a good idea. Yeah, maybe you could do that around a cyclone fence, but not around a tree. Um, so that's kind of what's happened here is mower blight. Now, actually, this can look like vole damage or mouse damage over the winter too. It looks similar, but it is a, a physical injury for sure. And we try to avoid that. And that's one of the good reasons why we do mulch thin and wide and it helps to prevent um, any kind of damage from, from mowing equipment. Now, this isn't something we've talked about in the four uh, that we've seen so far, uh, or the, this fourth series, is the separation of trees and turf. Each are different in terms of their need for water and fertilizer. In general, um, most shade trees are gonna need, oh, what would you say, Sarah, half or so, about as much water and fertilizer, if that, in terms of, um, than, than turf does. So right. separating them makes a lot of sense in a landscape design. And you see that illustrated here on the left. Yes. You know, oftentimes people don't realize how competitive turf grass can be for water and nutrients. And, and if, if, if trees are not located in a mulched bed of their own, it can actually hinder the growth and development of a tree. Um, so just eliminating that competition, even in a fairly small area, um, can really increase the vigor and health of your tree. So it, it's a great, uh, uh, it's a much preferred idea to separate the trees from the turf. It really is. And then on the right is where they have not done that. And so um, these were just sort of plopped in the middle of the, the stand. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, you can see there are probably as many dead needles on the ground uh, by these, from these spruce as there are live ones. And in this case, if you look at the lushness of the turf, it's due to the fact that the trees are being cared for at the same level of input as the turf is. And so they're being overwatered, over fertilized, and uh, eventually they will, they, will, they will really struggle. So if separation is good from the point that Sarah was making just from a, a, um, a competition standpoint, but it's also important from a uh, preventing over stimulation or over input standpoint as well. Right. Here is, are two more illustrations of the same thing on the right and on the left. On the left we have good separation of turf and ornamentals and on the right poor separation of turf and ornamentals mm -hmm. um, to the point where you can see them the tree struggling as well as some some root damage, uh, some surface root damage. If this tree were on the right were in a bed by itself, you wouldn't have, you'd have a surface root, but you wouldn't have the damage from the lawnmower. So right. um, another illustration is important to keep each on its own area. So John, we might go back to a question from Gloria. She um, lost a mature con color fir this spring, and she's, one, she's wondering what might be the causes for this tree's dying. Um, the tree was about 40 years old and it was planted when the house was built. She had an arborist look at it and they couldn't figure out why the tree had died. Um, they've been in the house three years and they re-landscaped the yard two years ago. So I guess one of the things that I would look at Gloria with that is that con color firs are one of the evergreens that really do not respond well for, to overwatering. So if you have, if the irrigation system is running too often and quite often people will set an irrigation system to run um, three or four times a week to keep their grass looking nice and green in the middle of the summer. And, and that could be way too much for the con color fir. Um, uh, creating that shallow area of, of moisture, um, of soil on the top of, 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 of soil at the top layer, which has um, a lot of water in it and a, not a lot of ga gas or oxygen exchange is occurring between through that layer of moist soil. So that could be part of the problem. Um, you might want to look at how often your irrigation system is running and how moist you're keeping the soil. Now, on the other hand, it could be um, that this tree had a, a stem girdling root or some kind of a root issue that resulted in its decline. Um, and if that was the case, it could be that, you know, the tree has been um, 
growing toward this eventuality for several years and you just happen to be the unfortunate one living in the house at the time when the tree actually died. Um, and there's no way that you'll be able to know if there were underlying root issues until the tree is taken down and, and the, if you pull the roots out and actually are able to look at them. Um, but actually with a 40 year old tree, you may not be able to do that. Um, so those would be some of the first things that I would think about with this tree that could have potentially been uh, causes of the, the death. Those are good ones to investigate. And again, why you try to separate the two. Yes. Um, another thing you would ha have to help you a little bit, again, would be the screwdriver. Um, what, what, how, you know, it's important to know about your irrigation in terms of the number of times a week, but it's also how long you run it. And, you know, it's a matter of how, just how wet you are make, keeping that root system and just how many air spaces are there. Uh, Sarah raises a really good point about we need oxygen. We need roughly half of that soil to be empty. And if you're constantly filling up all of those air spaces with moisture, then that's going to slowly and surely uh, bring the tree to an early death. All right. Um, and then uh, another one is sun scald, another one uh, that we want to prevent. And uh, Kelly talked a little bit about this. Um, but what happens, on, on, especially on thin bark trees in the wintertime, um, thin bark trees will um, warm up in the wintertime. Um, and, well, and, and what will happen is that will loosen just a bit and de-harden just a bit during the daytime. And then, of course, at night, it will get be cold. And then during the day, 50 degrees or so is very common, back down to uh, freezing at night. And this repeated high, low temperature over the winter uh, causes problems. So what we want to do is not keep the, the trunk warm. We want to keep it cold. We want to keep the trunk sort of a constant cold temperature because the tree is well adapted to staying cold. What it's not well adapted to is going through those fluctuations. So what you see on the right there is just an inexpensive piece of white PVC. You might use that for drain tile around your downspout. You can buy it at any home improvement store. It's, it's split in the middle with a hacksaw or a Dremel tool and then you just open it up and put it around the tree. And this would be installed around Thanksgiving and taking off, taken off around Easter, um, just mid-November through late March uh, in that time frame to reflect the summer, or excuse me, to reflect the wintertime sun. So this is something inexpensive you can do, especially on thin bark trees. So any of the white ash clones, the, any of the red maple, Norway maple, sugar maple, um, some of the birches are a little bit thin bark. Any of the fruit trees that John has taught us about, any of the apple, crab apple, um, uh, peach, nectarine, any of those types of trees that can get this kind of physical injury. Once the tree gets old enough that the bark starts to get thick and kind of corky, then you don't have to worry about this anymore because the tree is is much more resistant to this type of damage in the winter once the, the bark has become thicker and mature. It's only when the tree is young and the bark is thin that we have to be real concerned about this. Yeah, and the thickness helps a lot. Also a little bit of wintertime canopy. The branches grow out a little bit more and they also do a little shading. So the two together work really well. Let's move on to the mid and mature tree care, care category, which are trees that are, you know, kind of in that, uh, say, 15 to 40 year old areas. And some of these are continuations. Uh, of, of what we're doing, but just looked at in a slightly different way. The first thing to think about is what we've talked about a little bit already, especially with moisture and watering, but just where the roots are. And this is a schematic diagram from the Morton Arboretum, which is a fabulous visitation place in Chicago. If you're near that area, um, you, should, you should go. And it's a, it's a really great place to see and learn about trees. Uh, and so what this is talking about is what uh, illustration of what Sarah mentioned before, that trees will spread out um, a shallow and wide. So in the upper 18 inches of soil, um, there are some quick and easy ways to do it. If you want to double the, the um, drip line of the tree, that's a good quick estimate. Here's the drip line of the tree. If you just want to double that, there you go. Or if you want to take the tree and lay it on its side, the roots will spread as far as it is tall. So either way, that's going to get you kind of about where the, just a, a good first estimate to where uh, the tree roots actually are. 
Now, here's another thing that I literally tripped over and helped me understand um, how to, to, to learn about where the roots are. Um, this is on a, a little walk through a, a it's kind of like a forest, but it's more of a state park. And uh, you can just see how the, the first tapered root comes off. There's a little bit of, uh, or just a tad of, uh, you know, a little bit of erosion here uh, for us was beneficial because it uh, helped us understand where that first root comes off. And then if you look down the path, you see this root, this root, this root, and this root. That's where the other trees have had these surface roots. They're going to spread out um, low and, sh and shallow and, and wide. And this, is, this tree was planted by Mother Nature, and that's the way Mother Nature plants trees. So this is the illustration. It just helps us to understand where these tree roots are. So as we manage a mixed landscape of perennials, ground covers, turf grass, vegetables, and trees, it really helps us understand where tree roots are. And here's another illustration of tree roots, where tree roots are, but also adds in the complicating factor of soil volume, of just how much um, actual quantity of soil that tree roots have to grow in. All these trees are planted at the same time. This is at a commercial site in West Omaha. Um, and look at the difference. These are all the same species. Um, but the difference here is on the, on the left, the tree roots don't have much room to grow and they're surrounded by a lot of concrete. On the right, they have more room to grow. There's um, a more interrupted or uninterrupted space, a lot of percolation room, uh, less room uh, for that water to run off, a lot more opportunity for that to soak in, and just a much better uh, soil area for these trees to grow and do well. Um, we're going to continue to inspect for defects, but different kinds of defects, and the defects will look differently. Here's a tree that I looked at uh, earlier this year, and this is one that uh, was probably damaged by a string trimmer or a lawnmower early on in its life. And you can see the, the, the injury started here and moved its way up into here. So this is all physical injury, and now in the middle of this uh, is a big pocket of decay. This tree is unsafe at this point, and I uh, really was uh, sorry to have to tell the homeowner this, that this tree was um, in poor shape and needed to come down. Um, you can see another big wound here, and on the other side, if I remember right, another big wound. So uh, these are rather extensive. One of the things to inspect for are stem girdling roots, and Kelly talked quite a bit about stem girdling roots and avoiding them right from the get-go. There's, this is a good little digger tool, just a little hand claw that you might want to use. Just pull back the soil around a tree. And you can see several sets of girdling roots. Here's one. Here's one that starts here and wraps all the way around here. And what happens is over time, the root itself expands in size, just like the branches do. And of course, the trunk is expanding. And so the two push against each other and cause a real problem of, uh, of inclusion right there at that point. So this is not good, but you can't see it if all this soil is in place. So that's why a little bit of uh, just digging with that hand digger makes you at least be able to understand what's going on. Here's another pocket of decay by, caused by the same kind of thing. And this is common on clump types of plants like this river birch. Um, because again, this area here is pushing on this area here. And when that happens, in, in some cases, the tree's able to survive for quite a length of time, Sarah. In other cases, not so much. This tree is only about 10 years old. Right. Yeah. So th this one has, has a real short life ahead of it. And what happens is this kind of thing. This is the result of included bark. You can see this area is sort of concave, and that's a result of being pushed on this part of the trunk. Um, this broke away and failed and fell on, hopefully not anything important, um, it's interesting. This also, you see here, I just noticed this. This tree also had a girdling root right here. Mm -hmm. So this tree was a problem waiting to happen. And this is why inspection is so important to be able to look for that. Many times you'll see cracks develop in older stems, uh, older branches. You can see a big one here. Um, and that developed as a result of that heating and thawing uh, during the winter. Now, when you see something that needs to be taken out, um, uh, what we're looking for here is taking off the branch, as I started off talking about at the branch bark ridge, 
And this is something that Sarah calls callous roll. Yeah, so this is an example of a good pruning cut because you can see that the tree is responding to the pruning cut with new tissue. And that, that roll of tissue around the edge of the pruning uh, cut is called callus tissue. And eventually over the next three or four years, this callus tissue will continue to grow and eventually it will cover that whole wound. And this is, a, um, this is a, a, the best way to prevent wood rot from getting into the trunk is to have a good callus development that will seal over that, that um, area where the wound occurred. Now, if you see a pruning cut where the callus tissue is not developing evenly, as in this picture, see at the bottom of that cut, we have almost no callus tissue for a small section. And then also at the top, we have less callus tissue. That indicates that, that the pruning cut was made too close to the trunk in those two locations. And it's gonna be much more difficult for this tree to eventually seal that wound. In fact, it may not ever completely seal that wound. And that just allows wood rot to enter into the trunk uh, and to become a structural issue for this tree in years to come. So here you can see on this little tree, it's almost kind of hard to see it, but this is a completely sealed pruning wound where the callus tissue has just completely covered over the wound. That is ideal. That's what you want to see when a pruning cut is done correctly. And the when reason that happened was that they paid attention to the branch bark ridge right here and to the collar. And the, the reason we put this one in here is because it shows those structures. Here's right. the collar, here's the branch bark ridge, and the cut was made in the right place. The branch collar can be a little hard to um, find. It's, it's less obvious on the tree than the branch bark ridge. Usually it's just a little area of swelling at the base of the branch where it comes into the trunk. <coughs> um, so you, you typically want to find the branch bark ridge and then cut at an angle away from the trunk. And then that usually takes you outside the branch collar. And then there's always a few pests that trees get. And uh, you wanna look for the classic ones. This is an Austrian pine. This pest is called the Zimmerman pine moth. And whenever you're in a situation with pests, you wanna ask yourself, well, do we retain this plant in the landscape and manage it? Or is it so bad that we need to remove it? And with some pests, you lean more in the direction of retain and manage, and in others, over to removal. In my experience, Zimmerman pine moth is a serious pest, but not one that is that ultra serious um, and you know, uh, one that can't be overcome. And it just takes a few um, timely and judicious applications of the appropriate uh, intervention and it can happen. Here's one that is a little bit more in the in the uh, in the realm of oh my, do I want to keep this in the landscape? So again, Japanese beetle damage and a lot of us have seen this in various parts of the state can really devastate a, a young tree um, and and a mature tree. Uh, either one. I was um, looking at a tree last week and it was it was worse than this. There was less foliage on this tree than there is on this one. It, every leaf looked like a doily. Um, and in several years, it, it really loses its appeal for sure. And then also every year it gets damaged a little bit, it weakens the tree just a little bit more. So Japanese beetle is one of those you really scratch your head over, as is the emerald ash borer. And this is a photo I took um, of a, an infested tree um, and you can see the telltale signs, a really thin canopy, um, a lot of epicormic shoots at the base of the tree and the trunk is trying to regrow and trying to keep itself healthy. Um, so we, we put in one that was one that you might want to manage, one that's kind of on the fence, iffy iffy, and then one you probably would want to consider removing. It, now certainly emerald ash borer, if it's in a good location, if it's otherwise healthy, um, if it has a lot of value, um, it might be managed just fine, uh, but it also might be one to think about removal as well. So these are always that, you're always thinking about that retain, manage, or remove whenever you encounter a pest. And again, inspection is one of those kinds of things. And then we have a lot of pest-like issues. And one of the most common is iron chlorosis. Uh, iron chlorosis, along with a number of other trees, or another tree injuries, um, is a serious situation. And again, do you maintain it? 
and retain it in the landscape? Uh, do you manage it or do you remove it? Does it get cost so costly and so problematic in year after year after year after year treatments that it becomes sort of um, unsustainable or is it something that can be easily taken care of? Now, Sarah and I wanna talk a little bit about hiring a tree care professional. I think I'll mention the first one and then Sarah can go with the others. There's this uh, sort of horticultural odd job service in just about every town. And these are great people. They'll haul away some brush for you. They'll prune a hedge. They'll prune a fruit tree. It's kind of hard to find an arborist that will actually prune a fruit tree. Um, they'll grind out a stump. They'll do all these horticultural odd jobs. And it's important. These are tree care professionals that really help us manage our landscapes. But there are others too if the problem is more serious. Right, so the two um, logos that you see here on the screen, um, uh, the first one is ISA, which is the International Society of Arboriculture, and then the second is the Nebraska Arborist Association. Both of these organizations um, have a, a, a pretty rigorous training program that they will put potential arborists through, and then arborists have to pass a test that covers um, a multitude of topics from you know, tree selection, tree identification, tree planting, care, pruning, pest identification, ropes and climbing, safety in trees. Um, it's just, it's, it's a very rigorous training course. So what we typically recommend is that if you need help with a tree issue, whether it's pruning a tree, uh, and typically we would say if, if, you, if you can't prune whatever it is you need to prune from the ground, then, you, then we would recommend that you hire an arborist to do it for you because climbing in trees and uh, you know, with saws and chainsaws and uh, up, up above the ground is dangerous work. So if you can't do it from the ground, we would suggest that you hire an arborist. And you can go to either of these organizations website and they both have a search feature so that you can put in your state and your city and search for certified arborists that are near you. And then you can, that can give you a starting point um, uh, and a list of companies or arborists to call uh, for them to come out and take a look at your tree and see what kind of work needs to be done. So if you just um, Google them, the International Society of Arboriculture or the Nebraska Arborist Association, um, that will get you started to find the certified arborists near you. And they'll do good work. Um, there are some practices that um, are not uh, recommended. And sometimes they're uh, carried out by people who shouldn't be doing tree work. And we're just gonna, hi we're just gonna highlight three of them. Uh, the first one is called um, crown raising or excessive elevation. And what happens is uh, an unknowing tree care person, we'll call them arborists, <laughs> they actually just cut off all the low branches of the tree and they raise the, uh, the crown. And this is bad because what happens is the this will during the young part of a tree's life, um, it will decrease the stem strength, the trunk strength. And in an older part, like these are a little bit more mature trees, they will not get any stronger. So as the tree gets bigger and the crown grows, they will not strengthen in their ability to withstand tree uh, stress and, and the energy of a, of, a, of, a, of a storm or something like that. And so it's sort of the kind of the lazy uh, way to do it is just to get uh, a lot of it uh, taken care of easily that way. And a lot of this, unfortunately, is all due to the, the interest of the homeowner to let grass grow underneath the tree. Um, and certainly there are better options than that. So uh, you want to make sure that whoever you hire, you avoid excessive elevation. This next one is called lion's tailing. Oh, go ahead. I might just mention, John, in that last picture, that as this person who was doing the pruning raised or removed the lower limbs, what they did is they created several co-dominant branches in each of, each of these trees, all with narrow branch angles. So they've, they've reduced the, um, the strength and attachment of those branches and they've actually created tr a tree with several points where the trees could easily fail. And that was just because they, they didn't know how to prune correctly um, and they weren't addressing these co-dominant narrow branch angles um, uh, in the right way. Yeah, thinning would have been the way to go. And unfortunately, they just did the easy thing and cut off all the low branches. Right. So good, I'm glad you pointed that out. Another bad practice is what's called lion's tailing. 
And it's, a, it's sort of a similar thing to uh, crown raising, um, but it's really, if you look at this lowest branch here, you see a, a branch that is devoid of any, of any uh, side branches, and then just sort of a puff of growth at the end. And what happens here is this prevents the tree's ability to diffuse the energy of a storm, and it creates actually a stronger lever. The physicists that work with the International Society of Arboriculture have actually documented that the force uh, of the whipping and tearing uh, on the, the, the ex that is exerted on the end of this branch becomes greater than if the branches were not removed before. So the, the way to diffuse the energy of a storm is to have a big full canopy. And unfortunately, what you've done here is you've gotten a smaller, thinner canopy, which then is less able to diffuse the energy of the storm. So lion's tailing is ugly for one thing, but it's also bad structurally. And then of course, I think everybody knows this one. This is called topping. And you wanna to avoid topping a tree because instead of um, reducing the height, you're actually increasing the height. And so you cut off one branch and four grow in its place. And then you also have this horrible effect of very co-dominant leaders, very poor attachment, uh, weakly grown branches instead of ones that are grown organically down into the center of the tree. And um, you see that here as well. And all of these become a real problem because now they're right in, in close proximity to the, the house and very likely to fall in the house and or the street, the driveway, um, the sidewalk. And there's lots of what we call targets nearby for a poorly uh, structural tree. John, could you go back to that last picture and maybe with your cursor show people where this tree was topped? They may have trouble seeing where that where that happened. Okay, so the tree was topped right here where the cursor is, thank you, and right here. And so instead of one branch, now you have one, two, three, four branches. Same thing here, a cut right here. You can kind of tell by the color of the wood. Mm -hmm. This light colored wood is the new growth and this is the older growth. And essentially, it was just sort of cut in an umbrella if you hear a tree care provider said that, say something like that, that I can create an umbrella look for you, start looking for another tree care provider. Um, again, this is, this is a very bad practice and creates a lot of top heavy growth that is poorly attached, that is weakly attached and becomes a real liability in the landscape. So thanks for, that's obvious to me, but you're right. I, I think I need to always point stuff like that out. Yeah. Okay, that's my last slide, I think. So John, we had a question from Sherry and she was asking about how can you tell when crown elevation is excessive? And Kelly answered her question with the, the general rule is that the canopy, the leafed, the leafed part of the canopy should be two thirds the overall height of the tree. And the trunk, the, the, the bare trunk should be one third the height of the tree. So if you keep those, those proportions in play as the tree gets larger, that should, or the tree gets taller that should give you an indication of how far you can limb up the lower branches and still keep that two-thirds, one-third proportion. Okay, then we Thank had another, you, Kelly, for doing that. Yes. another question from Megan who had asked, um, they just uh, trimmed up some lower branches on several trees that line their driveway and she's wondering if um, uh, she created some problems. They cut the branches off at the trunk. So what do you think about that, John? Well, generally, if you're going to need, if you're going to remove a branch, uh, removal at the trunk is a good practice. Um, it's the, the removal point is always um, where you want to make sure that you're not cutting it off and leaving just a little puff of growth. So if you can't remove it any other ways, removing at the trunk is, is not the problem. The problem is when you take off too much or what's called a pruning dose uh, to where you take off too many branches within a given year. Right. So if they wanted to, they could send us a photo and we could tell them if there's any other steps that need to be taken or something to avoid in the future. They could send that to either you or me, but uh, you know, cutting it at the trunk is not something to be overly worried about. And hopefully they, they were not making just a flat cut against the trunk, that they were keeping their cuts outside of that branch bark ridge and that branch collar so that you get good sealing of those pruning wounds in the future years. Mm -hmm.